and he shared with me that um that he said that he said that he had him a black woman and he said he said he had a white woman and a Nubian queen. Okay. Meaning that he just couldn't have a black woman. If she was a black woman, she had to be a specific type of black woman. She had to be a Nubian queen. Is that was her appearance or her ideology. Uh, evidently, he's talking about he's talking about her ideology. She had to be perfected. Okay, meaning that he didn't want no hood rat. He didn't want no hood rat just because she was black. I ain't settling for no hood rat that's gonna mistreat me. And, and you know, I gotta keep it real. I have respect for that position. I don't believe in it. I don't want me. I don't want me no white woman too. But I did have respect for the position that we got to be able to uh, 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 refine ourselves. Okay. No man wants to be mistreated by the woman. No woman wants to be mistreated by the man. So we got to make ourselves. We got to perfect our. That's one of the things I can respect with the Nation of Islam. They got men's. They got men's meeting. On Monday, and then they got MGT meeting where the women work to polish themselves. You know what I mean? That's my speaker. Hold on. The women work to polish themselves in, in those groups and so forth. You know, you ever seen an MGT? I had a lot of respect for Sister Ava Muhammad. Okay, she just passed this year. And really, uh, the black man needs a holy woman. See, the brother that I was telling you in prison was that statement he made. That statement was directed toward uh, him having to deal with certain black women that were roguish. You know what I'm saying? But he was probably roguish himself. So if you roguish dude, you're going to attract roguish women. You know what I mean? So, so he might have got what he was putting out. So it's necessary for us to shape ourselves. You know what I'm saying? To know how to present ourselves. To be respectful to ourselves and to one another, we got to be taught this, taught this, and reminded of this all over again. My sister Amy Park used to always say, "We just got to go back and do our works all over again," and that's what we really do. You know, in the twenties, they used to have in the twenties, thirties, forties, and fifties, they had these etiquette groups where they would teach black women etiquette. Had you, had you anybody in your family ever told you about it? Yeah, I think my grandmother has uh, reminisced on that time period. <laughs> yeah, they, they taught black women etiquette where they could handle themselves in a certain type of way. Okay. Uh, I think I continue to think that that has its place. I grew up in the church. Growing up in the church really gave that to me, even though I left the church and went out in the street. Okay. But, you know, that still was placed in me to, to have some type of decorum, some type of respect. Yeah. So, you know, it's easy to, it's easy to act roguish. You know what I mean? But it, it takes, it, it takes tact, it takes intelligence to handle yourself in a more respectful way. I think we deserve that to ourselves and to each other. So, that African American History Museum, I believe that that could, when I say African American History Museum, it, it has to be, I'd like to be over top of something like that. Even though we don't have one right now, I'd like to have one where it shows um, the success. See, because here in West Virginia, you had a lot of people come to this area from the South. My grandfather came here on the run after he had knocked his boss out. But he was a hard worker. Both of my grandfathers were hard workers. They were, they were more harder workers than what I am. I'm just here on the, on, on the shoulders of the work they put in. Okay? And I ain't got to work as hard as they work. Okay? But we still haven't gotten justice. I think they, 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 they work too hard for me to just sit around and not demand justice. I ain't going to say we. For us to sit around and not demand justice. Because it's a, it's a it's a little easier life for us, but without justice, it's 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 no no. Yeah. So, oh hey, that that question that you asked me about those other groups, um, other groups, other parties, and so forth, uh, that's why I find you know like I got appointed to this position as national chairman of Black Unity Coalition back in two thousand seven. 
It wasn't something that I asked for. It wasn't so I wasn't didn't raise my hand. I want to be a leader. No, it was part of the work that I put in because I was challenged. Malik Zulu told me when the hate crime jumped off, he said, yo, man, there's some stuff that done happened in your backyard. You got an obligation and duty to do something about it. I said, okay. Um, <laughs> so, I, did have a convers- I mean, I had a question about that. Because um, I read the article that I took a picture of at your place. So do you consider people who align themselves with groups like the NAACP to be conscious? Well, people that align themselves with groups like the NAACP can be conscious. They can. Uh, I was going to show you a video that I had here with, with Jerry. But, you know, those, uh, even though you can be in, in a group called the NAACP and be conscious, uh, I tend to think that the NAACP, uh, today's NAACP is like a bourgeois fraternity. Now, 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 I said it. Now, how about that? <laughs> yeah, today's NAACP is a bourgeois fraternity. I don't see nobody in the NAACP doing no direct action, doing anything so anything near militant. Okay, they know if something jumped off, NAACP said they got fifty thousand people. If something jumped off, they wouldn't be able to get ten of them together. Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Oh, okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah. You know, the NAACP com- comes out of those, uh, it really comes out of those fraternities. I don't know, the, the, those boule fraternities, I don't know if you're aware of that or not. You know, some part, Somebody might say, oh, there you go. I mean, yes, but people wouldn't say that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I've heard that before. But, but well, the bourgeois element. I don't really, you know, if they back there doing rituals or something, I don't really get into that. <laughs> but I do agree that they're, they're very bourgeois and have bourgeois values. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's wherever you go. I'm Like I told you, I also grew up in, in the Shenango Valley. NAACP, in that area, my pastor was the, uh, the chairman of it. His wife was the, uh, she was over top of the Urban League. So they had both groups sold up, okay? And uh, I had gotten a fight with a white boy and I was being prosecuted, right? And uh, I needed help. So I went to my pastor. I said, uh, Reverend Smith, man, I, I'm looking for some support. He looked at me and told me, nope, John, I, I, I can't help you. I said, what? He told me the prosecutor was his buddy. And he had to, he had to give me up for the prosecutor. He had more, and I was I was kind of hurt by that. He had more allegiance for the white prosecutor that was prosecuting me, told me, I can't help you. I said, well, if you can't help me, I'm going to have to get help from somebody else. Then he gets mad, and his wife tell, his wife puts him in check. If you can't help him, he's going to have to get some help from somebody. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know? So yeah. it's the allegiance that these folks make to these people. I mean, look, I got to tell you one more thing. I, I got to get this out because I was sitting back thinking about it. I was a political prisoner doing time in prison in the death of what I, what I call the Ku Klux Klansman. We later found out that he was, okay? Uh, my first appeal had been shot down and all the lawyers had sold me out. So I filed a, a, uh, I filed a, uh, a habeas corpus Ineffective assistance of appeal, uh, ineffective assistance of counsel on appeal against the lawyer. The Supreme Court granted the writ and appointed me Bob Cohen, who who was who was from Fairmont. Bob was a Jew, but this but this is the part I need to tell you right. Until the Supreme Court pointed the West Virginia Supreme Court pointed Bob Cohen, it was black people that I knew. Some of the black people was being used against me. But until I got Bob Cohen, I couldn't get no help from the black the black uh, uh, black lawyers. One of them was Greg Hinton. Frank Kleckley was cool with me, but he really didn't come out and show no support until Bob Cohen got appointed as my lawyer. Once Bob Cohen got appointed as my lawyer, it was all right for the the bourgeois 
professional class of black people to show support for me. I had to go over that shit. In my, and when I went over that, it's telling me that's all that stuff about Kanye West and the Jews having power. Look, what helped me get out of prison is the fact that I get the state Supreme Court appointed me a white Jewish lawyer who had pulled an influence among the bourgeois class of professional blacks. Otherwise, the Negroes don't give me no help. They watch me go down the toilet. So, so you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. The Jews got more influence on our prof- on, on, on our professional class than what we do. That's what, and I got some. I feel some type of way about that right now because we're still up under that bullshit. Excuse me. For, you know, I ran into Bob Cohen here. I hadn't seen him in a while. I was with a friend of mine. And I ran into him every time I see him. I run up on him. I tell him to his face. I can't help but love you. Because Bob did his job. Okay? He did his job. He caught hell from white folks. Don't you think he didn't catch hell from white folks? He done got him out of prison. He needed to stay there. Yeah, but... I mean, do you have the same general idea about BLM as well? Um... Look, I'm gonna tell you about BLM. Uh, my my friend was Sister Amy Parks, and when she called me uh, during the George Floyd protest and asked me if I was out there in the street, and I told her I wasn't out there, Amy. I'm, I didn't had my protest in, but uh, she was in support of Black Lives Matter, and I told her I had some questions about Black Lives Matter, but she told me that they had the name, which drew just drew the kind of attention to the movement that was necessary. I said, Miss Amy, are they going to ask for reparations or are they going to keep going around in circles? She said, John, just work with them. Hold up, just work with them. So I said, okay, I, out of respect due to my elders, I'm going to sit back and work see what see what's going to happen with Black Lives Matter. Uh, today, we don't hear too much from Black Lives Matter. It seemed like it was a flash movement, okay? We don't hear too much more from Black Lives Matter now. And I don't think Black Lives Matter is going to turn the corner and go for reparations. I don't think they're going to come out on that. We're going to need another group to come out on it. You know? So when you ask me about Black Lives Matter, I think Black Lives Matter has went the way of other groups like the Tea Party. It was a flash organ. I think it was a flash organization that was was propped up with some white folks' help. Okay? Uh, at, at that particular time. However... Yeah. However, I went to the Beyonce Taylor March downtown Morgantown. Okay, whoever organized it, as long as it was done, Black Lives Matter. If they do a reparations march, I'd be there. I and I'd be like, I ain't a Black Lives Matter person. I'm not. I always t- said, told people all the times, yes, Black lives do matter, but I'm not a Black Lives Matter organizer. But you understand, know I put a disclaimer to that shit. So. So I could I could I could work with Black Lives Matter to the extent of accomplishing the greater goal, but I still tell them that I'm not a Black Lives Matter organizer. Okay, I'm just a Black nationalist that want to see change that we haven't got, and I know if we going if we gonna get justice, we got to make it happen for ourselves. You know, so you know, Black Lives Matter, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, is complicated, and it appears. That Black Lives Matter is done. That's what it appears. Okay. I, mean, I know they still operate, but you- yeah, you go. You, you said you know they still operate. I I haven't heard anything. Uh, I I got to be honest. I haven't heard anything about Black Lives Matter in the media. It, 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 it almost appears as if the media has done a blackout on them. Hmm. You know. And that's, I guess the last time I heard about it a lot was during the protests in 2020. Yeah, yeah, you heard about them doing the protests in 2020, and after after that, you that's it. Yeah. No, something else I noticed about Black Lives Matter, like you know, with, with various organizations and group, like uh, there's not one of them. There's not a, a 
an office here in Morgantown or a state office in, that I know of in West Virginia or in Pennsylvania where they got people all throughout the country and stuff. You know what I'm saying? Where they got, where they got, uh, you know, where they got sites all throughout the country. I, I notice I don't see that with Black Lives Matter. You know, so. Transition issues. You said that they don't have offices in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, but they're not cut, cut off after. Yeah, I, I, I don't see them having sites spread throughout the country. I see them having one or two key people that they that they reference, in the, but I don't see them having no no genuine organizational base, and and that's that's really not to put them down. It just seems like the whole idea of Black Lives Matter was sloganeer based mobilization. I had to make up a word for that slogan sloganeer based mobilization. I just made that word up, but that's what we get. The whole term Black Lives Matter was a slogan based mobilization. I agree. Everybody comes out, but you know, like I said, look, the stuff that happened to we in, in 2020, you had George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. There was others too. That wasn't just them too. It was others too. The, the, the list is so long, you know, about the people, people that suffered and killed as a result of police uh, encounters. The one that always gets me, I got to say it, is Sandra Bland. And I didn't, I, I didn't watch Sandra, the stuff with Sandra Bland for a long time, but people kept egging me. You got to watch this. You got to watch this. And I finally watched it. And you, oh my God. When she hollered and said, you hit my head on the, when she said, you hit my head on the concrete, that's too much for me. I had to tell, I had to tell my mother, I'm a man. That stuff triggered me and I'd be wanting to go out and, 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 and lay somebody on the ground. I feel what you're saying. That one was definitely a turning point for me, along with Corinne Gaines, just because it's. Yeah. I just saw more of myself in them. I'd be like, well, I don't drive, but I could easily be smoking a cigarette. And if someone, you know, I'm grown. If someone told me to put my cigarette out, of course I would get very indignant. <laughs> and who knows what would happen next. I hear you, sis. Her too. I talked to an Atlanta friend of mine who's, a, who's an activist, a female activist, and she asked me about her. Now, it was, let me say this. It was some brothers that contacted me and was like, hey, she should have had more concern for her child and everything with the pol when the police told her that instead of riffing back 